Hello, and welcome to Raising the Bar with the MBBA. I'm Jason Clark, president of the Metropolitan Black Bar Association. Sadly, my co-host Adiola Adijobi won't be able to join us today, but we'll be back with us soon. The Metropolitan Black Bar Association is the largest association of predominantly African-American attorneys in New York. Our goal is to advance equality in the pursuit of justice, assist in the professional development of our members, and address legal issues affecting New Yorkers. The purpose of raising the bar with the MBBA is to foster a substantive conversation about justice issues in our community and try to identify a couple of solutions in the process. Today, we're going to take a deeper dive into gentrification. Joining me today are attorney Chanel Autry and Henry Floyd Jr. Welcome, and let's get to it. All right. So uh, actually, before we start talking about uh, gentrification, why don't both of you say a little bit about who you are? Sure. Ladies I'm first. Happy, sure. Uh, <laughs> so, name is Chanel Autry, as you mentioned. I am a lawyer down in D.C. Um, I work for our local city council, and most of my work focuses on business and economic development policy in the community. I've also done some criminal justice related legislation as well. So that is my background. Great, thank okay. you, welcome. Thank you for having me, Jason. Uh, my name is Henry Floyd Jr. I am an associate attorney at Coons McKinney Johnson DePaulis and Lightfoot. Try saying that five times. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my practice area is focused primarily on personal injury, workers' comp, and medical malpractice. And I'm also president of the Washington Bar Association, which is the DC affiliate for the National Bar Association. Right. Uh, and our motto is equal justice under law. You know, and we have some of the same. You know. Um, some of the same initiatives and, and you know, uh, models as, as the MBBA. Mm -hmm. So we're just great. trying to fight for our communities. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's actually what's great about this episode and a couple of others. I mean, we're going to have people from the National Bar Association, which we're New York, uh, the MBBA is the New York City affiliate of. So we're going to hear some ideas that are not just affecting folks in New York, but some of the things that are out there affecting other communities. Right. So uh, today we're talking about gentrification. So yes. Let's get started by saying, you know, what is gentrification and how does it affect communities? I'm going to let Henry start. Okay. And then I will follow. For okay. me, gentrification is, is, is simple. It's the systemic uh, displacement of people through economic development. Uh, and, and that's just pretty much when, and we were talking earlier about when you bring in certain, you know, certain things such as the Whole Foods, we know that, okay, that so, someone is targeted, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but it, it really is a display, displacement of, of communities of color. Um, and, and that economic development that comes along with that displacement is making home prices so high that we cannot afford them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's the tragedy of it. I mean, I just echo what Henry said. I think that gentrification most certainly is systematic displacement of folks of color, but I also think it further erodes the opportunity to build generational wealth yes. because it, it leads to a lack of affordable housing, um, opportunities to, if you're interested, become a small or local business, or even if you're interested in commercial retail space, um, when pricing gets so high, it's very hard to then be able to invest in the community in that way. So that's, uh, so that's interesting because, you know, when we hear about gentrification, you know, usually there are the two sides we hear about. You know, we right. hear about, you know, the fact that usually when a, um, a community may be gentrifying, uh, sometimes it's uh, uh, accompanied by maybe the area being safer or maybe some of the schools getting better because there's more money that can actually go to them. Um, but there is this other side, which Henry and Chanel, you've been talking about, which is the idea that sometimes the folks that are actually living in those communities are displaced and can no longer to be there. So um, let's talk about that economic side of that. So how does economic development play a role in gentrification, especially when we're talking about cities and government? Chanel? Sure, so the interesting thing about economic <coughs> development is that Depending on where you are, it affects land value. Mm -hmm. It affects the uh, prices for homes in the neighborhood that you are in. Um, if, for instance, a very large, um, let's say, shopping mall comes in a community, sure. uh, then at that point, you know, it's going to bring in more tourism. It's going to definitely bring in more dollars, which I think is what you've alluded to. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's then going to cause other community related issues, which is if I was interested in buying over here, I might now be priced out because right. the price for homes has increased exponentially. Um, in addition to that, I might not have the money to go to the mall 
that was just created. And so now there's this amazing amenity in my community that I don't benefit from or that I can't take advantage of. And so I think when we think about it from the economic development side, the most important thing we have to think of is what are the community benefits associated with these economic development deals? You know, are we talking to the community about what they want and what they need in these developments? Um, is it going to be workforce development that they get? Are there going to be construction jobs, you know, long-term permanent jobs? Um, all of those things kind of come as a whole package when we think about economic development. And I think to some extent, cities have to do a better job of making sure that communities, particularly communities of color, have an opportunity to invest in what's being created. And I echo everything Chanel has said and, and add to that, it's, it's a twofold. Mm -hmm. It's a twofold. You know, you of course want the benefits right. of the economic the, you know, development, but the disadvantages normally outweigh the benefits of it. You know, and like Chanel said, we, I, I don't think we have the necessary conversations that we need to have with the people who are living in those communities in order to make informed decisions. Mm -hmm. Normally, those decisions are being made by our politicians, our elected officials, mm -hmm. um, and the developers. And you, I, I will say, what, maybe one or two town halls where they can get the information and hear from the people in those communities, mm -hmm. but that's just not enough. Right. You know, one or two town halls saying, you know, how do you feel about bringing this project to this area? It's just not enough because some people may not make it, be able to make it out to that particular meeting or one of those meetings. And so you don't get a majority of you know, how people are feeling in those communities. Uh, and, and understand, they don't have an obligation to do that. But in order for anything to be successful, they would need that information. Mm -hmm. You see, that's the, that's the interesting thing, because I think especially when we're talking about New York, you know, one thing that comes to mind and what people always uh, celebrate is that when uh, Congressman Charlie Rangel mm -hmm. uh, was able to bring empowerment zones to Harlem. Right. And in doing so, he was able to infiltrate, you know, new revenue that was able to help with kind of the, the developments of the community. Right. Now, the other side of it is, I mean, Harlem now is in an area where it, I think most people would describe it as gentrifying, yes. um, where there are a ton of uh, entities and individuals who are purchasing, you know, um, uh, property to put, you know, high rise, you know, luxury apartment buildings there. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I know that the median income in an area like Harlem is 29,000. So right. I know there's been some similar stuff in DC. Mm -hmm. right. So I guess, can we talk a little bit more, I think, especially to what you are starting to uh, allude to is, you know, how do you, I guess, get some of the benefits, you know, because I think most of us want some of those things, but at the same time, how, what benefits or what policies are there that can really be able to protect the communities that have been living there or the, protect the individuals who've been in those communities for years? Yeah, so it's super interesting. Um, there's a, a bunch of articles out about D.C. Yes. And between 2000 to 2013, D.C. was considered the most gentrified city in the United States. Wow. Um, and so we have a history of, uh, you know, really wanting economic development, wanting to have a very burgeoning, large nation's capital, right. but at the same time, some of the policies that were originally put in place didn't necessarily benefit the communities um, that needed those benefits. And so now we have, we have several different policies, but one thing we do have is we have a requirement that each development agreement has to be, has to include a community benefits agreement. And it has to be negotiated with our, what we call our local ANCs, which is our advisory neighborhood commissions. And they have to agree to it. And the developers are held to making sure that they comply with the agreement. If they don't comply with the agreement, then they have to go, uh, then the community can go to the zoning commission and say they are not abiding by what they said that they would do. Mm -hmm. And so then there can be a hearing and then you know, more collaboration and other things to happen to try to right kind of the situation. Um, and so there's, there are things like that, but we also, similar to what um, you kind of alluded to, is we have um, a lot of uh, tax policies and tax incentives um, mm -hmm. that are for like commercial development for what we call our QHTC, which is Qualified High Technology Companies. Um, and so companies that are coming to the district that are providing some type of you know, burgeoning technology or providing opportunities in the technology space, there are additional tax incentives for them uh, to be able to be in the district. Um, and all of those things are great, but I think what we have to do a better job of, 
is probably doing a look back. So two right. years after the development, mm -hmm. what is it looking like? Because you said you were going to create 336 jobs in the community. Is it really 336 or is it six? Like where right. have we, <laughs> Correct. where have we, end, right? where Correct. have we ended up after that, right? Mm -hmm. So I think we're getting better, but we need more policies that provide transparency both during and after the process. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I agree with Chanel on that as far as the analysis of it. Go back and see how it has worked. And if it has not worked, let's, let's get together and figure out why mm -hmm. and find more solutions. And I think when it comes to gentrification, you know, and economic development is, okay, here it is. We put it in, y'all let us put it in, and we forget about everybody that is affected. Mm -hmm. So now you have a majority of communities of color that are leaving the city, leaving D.C., and moving to Maryland. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now Maryland is booming, you mm -hmm. know, with communities of color because of the, the, the price differential, mm -hmm. you know? It's cheaper to live in Maryland. Everyone knows that because D.C. has always been higher than Maryland. Mm -hmm. D.C. has always been higher than, you know, parts of Virginia. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you, you're making those prices in, in D.C. higher. So you don't give anyone any incentive on staying or even trying to come back. Right. You know, and, and that's the only areas that the, that most communities of colors know, Absolutely. you know. So in this analysis, what do we do? We OK, like Chanel said, how many jobs did it produce? If it didn't hit your target audience or, mm -hmm. or your target number, you need to reevaluate. Mm -hmm. At the same time, when you put in, you mentioned the high rise condominiums, you know, and all of those beautiful buildings that we see, the beautiful buildings that we see, do you were there a certain number of those apartments and those buildings or those condos, is there something in place that says, okay, this is a cap on how much we can charge for this particular condominium or apartment so people are not just displaced, mm -hmm. that people can make adjustments in, in, in what they feel like they may be able to afford mm -hmm. so they don't have to displace themselves, so they don't have to move out. You know, is there something in writing? Is there something in the policy or something in the agreement? You know, the contract that says, okay, out of 300 condominiums of, or apartments, 25 of them are capped. Mm -hmm. Do we have that? And if we don't have that analysis, then whoever's negotiating the contracts with the economic developers are doing a poor job. Yeah, and that's an interesting point. And it actually even kind of uh, uh, makes us think back to some of the other shows that we've had recently. We've been doing, uh, we've had a couple of shows now that have to do with uh, tenant harassment. And the idea mm -hmm. behind there is the fact that folks would you know, maybe purchase um, uh, a, a parcel of property mm -hmm. and, you know, again, put in some high-rise condominium buildings. Right. But in doing so, you know, try to have some tactics to try to push people out of actual apartment unions that are already right. there. Right. And since, especially in New York, and especially in, New, in uh, New York City and Manhattan, there's a finite amount of space. Right. You know, there, it's kind of a, um, there's this, Extra, there had been for a long time this extra incentive to try to displace folks. So, yeah. you know, maybe a little different as I'm saying that, you know, with New York maybe um, as opposed to, uh, you know, D.C. or Maryland. But, you know, let's flesh out a little bit more about that displacement part. Like, how do we prevent folks from being displaced from communities where maybe they've been living there for a number of generations until now all of a sudden it's the next hot and booming um, property or neighborhood? I'll go. I mean, I think there's a, a real need for education about rights, cool. uh, housing cool. rights, tenant rights, l landlord rights, um, just generally because what often happens is you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a landlord who's telling you something and saying, oh, well, I can increase the rent by 20 percent each year and that's my right. Don't you remember you signed that agreement and it says it. Oh, you can't find it. Right. But it sounds wrong, it feels wrong, and it is Correct. wrong. Um, and so I think we have to work on figuring out how to educate folks about their rights. And then even a step beyond that, I think we also have to figure out more organizing power uh, yes. with more grassroots organizations and other nonprofits who are working in these spaces. There are great organizations, as we know, like Catholic Charities and Bread for the City in D.C. and yes. other entities that work on housing rights and that work in these spaces. We need to be having more community forums, more opportunities for people to learn about what their rights are and also how to create generational wealth. Because if you don't know how to do that or you can't figure out how to create a viable plan within your budget, then you never get there. Right.
right. Uh, and one thing to piggyback on Chanel, uh, Washington Bar, what we have is we have a, a committee, our Knowledge is Power Committee. Uh, and that's strictly for service to the community and getting the resources out to them. Mm -hmm. We had an amazing um, housing seminar um, some time ago, and it was bringing in different organizations, Neighborhood Legal Services Project, uh, you know, Bread for the City, mm -hmm. different, different, uh, you know, organizations to bring in the resources because the the community did not know that they had these resources. Okay. Sounds like a good idea. We'll have to steal so it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'll start doing it. Next year, the NBA will be having its housing symposium. You heard yeah, first listen. from Washington Bar. Look at <laughs> But no, it, and, and, you know, we had an amazing turnout um, at, yeah. the, at the seminar because people just really did not know what their rights were. Right. And we were take, we were saving people from foreclosure and different things like that because they just did not know. Right. And that's what we do as the Washington Bar. We just provide them those resources and put them in touch with the people that they need to be in touch with. You know, and uh, like Chanel said, we have, we have amazing community activists, mm -hmm. you know, but it's us supporting them in order to protect everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's, you know, whenever they go to even the district, mm -hmm. you know, the district council, uh, you know, and, and making sure that, you know, when something is in place or someone has proposed a bill, supporting that bill, okay. you know, and, and, and I think most people don't do that because it's a fear of, well, I just don't know what it says. I don't know. You know, it's a lot. It's a lot of words mm -hmm. on the paper to a lot of people who don't know what to do with that, with that particular piece of paper, mm -hmm. you know. So it's as attorneys, it's us giving the pro bono hours to say, you know, to the communities to say, mm -hmm. you know, we'll break this bill down for you, holding those seminars, you know, and saying, we'll explain this to you so you get a better sense of what it is and how to protect yourself. Absolutely. Now, and just, and, and we can't make you do it, but providing you the information, that's the least that we can do as attorneys. Okay. Absolutely, and I'm, just before you, Henry hit the nail on the head when he, when he said, you have to be involved in your state and local government. Mm -hmm. It is essential to change and what often happens is the people who show up don't look like those of us sitting at the table. Correct. Um, and so then those needs and those, those, needs and those uh, issues and concerns tend to get addressed a little bit more quickly yes. because they're coming down and, you know, sitting in the local legislator like, mm -hmm. hey, uh, if you guys pass this bill, it's go you guys are going to get some political pressure and it's not going to be good pressure. Right. So we have to figure out ways to... Uh, get more folks to come out and lobby, figure out how to do that within the confines of their schedule. Because, right, single mom can't come to the, uh, the Wilson Building, which is our, our local seat of government, and be there waiting to testify from nine to two. She's gotta yeah. work and she's gotta go pick up her child. Right. So we gotta figure out better ways to meet people where they are. With and that. I know it opens up a lot, but it, it's tactics because I've, I've testified before congressional bodies mm -hmm. Um, on on bills that have negatively impacted our communities, mm -hmm. and what the the writers of those bills have done is, I see a lot of you know our communities come in, mm -hmm. they're ready to testify. So at, at nine o'clock, you got buses and everything else, and we're mm -hmm. flooding the building, ready to testify. And what they do is they push the bill back to the end of the day, five o'clock, seven o'clock, eight o'clock. Well, by that time, you got maybe ten people that's ready to testify hmm. when you had about a thousand this morning. Hmm. So, and, and what they do is they, they take other bills and take other bills and take other bills. So it's, it's really trying to, it's a tactic. It's really trying to deal with that, those tactics, but at the same time have our, our local elected officials, yeah, you know, fighting for us as well and fighting for everybody, not mm -hmm. just us, but fighting for everybody mm -hmm. for what's right. You know, okay. So it certainly sounds like what you, what both of you are saying is, I think maybe you have to be a little bit more mindful of some of the tactics people use to yes. try to obstruct some of the work we yes. try to do to reduce some of the negative effects of gentrification. Yes. But at the same time, we have to figure out ways to mobilize and empower mm -hmm. so that we can do a better job about pushing for some of our uh, policies that would be helpful to folks who have been in these uh, communities. Right. And don't changing. get me wrong, I, I, you know. We, we want the benefits. We want everyone to enjoy the amenities right. of the development. We just don't want to push anyone out right. to where they cannot enjoy those. You know what I'm saying? And we're not saying don't throw up the high-rise condominiums, but don't put everybody out in the process. Right. Yeah. No, and, and that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, it, again, it's those two 
you know, struggling two issues where yeah. one, you know, you want better communities, you want better resources for the people in right. the communities, mm -hmm. but you also don't want the people that have been in those communities, you know, for generations to Correct. now be this place and yeah. have to leave all that they've known just because yeah. all of a sudden it's become like a hot spot. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so with that said, so what are some of these policies? I mean, I think we've kind of fleshed it a little mm -hmm. bit, but like what are some of the policies that you think can be able to protect people from having to be displaced? Sure. Well, I mean, I, I know a lot of localities have uh, a requirement that certain percentages of uh, units in a development have mm -hmm. to be devoted to certain percentages of the area median income. Okay. Or it, we have a concept which is called inclusionary zoning. And so the, it, there's a finite amount of units that have to be set within each development for people who are considered low income, which is defined in the district code. Um, but I think there's some new interesting things happening. I, opportunity zones, um, really interesting concept. Um, and I know that the district has, I believe, 20 to 25 census tracts where they're working on uh, getting more folks, or more developers to buy into those neighborhoods and create some commercial development with the community. And that's your definition of opportunities. I was going to ask you yes, that, but it sounds yes, like that's what you're saying. It's, so it's, a, it's a federal concept, but each government has chosen um, certain census tracts that fit within that, what they're calling kind of like distressed business areas or areas where there's not a whole lot of economic viability right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's things like that, but I also think that we have to think a little bit more creatively about like food deserts, like Henry yes. knows we have uh, yes. east of the river in mm -hmm. D.C., we have a food desert in many mm -hmm. neighborhoods, only corner stores and only liquor stores and things like right. that. And so policies that lend themselves towards providing opportunities or other incentives for developers to bring things that communities need, like fresh produce, yes. those are things that we have to focus on. And those are the policies mm -hmm. that make sense. And again, and you know, and I think I've addressed it, I think we've touched on it earlier, is our elected officials listening, coming out and listening to the community, what it, it is, what it is that they need, mm -hmm. and not just during election season, right. you know? And, and, and that's, a, that's a big thing because you're not just displaced, you know, mm -hmm. during election season, you're displaced all the time, mm -hmm. you know? So don't let your elected officials only come out, hold them accountable, yep. you know? Make them listen to you. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if that means going back to the Wilson building and having the, you know, and flooding the Wilson building and saying, I want to talk to my council member, do that, you know, yeah. and we need to organize, but not just during what once out of every four years, yeah. you right. know, when sure. they feel like it's going to be beneficial for them to keep a seat, you yeah. know, they need to listen to their communities. Okay. Mm -hmm. So one thing you had actually alluded to a couple of times is this uh, concept of generational wealth. Mm -hmm. yes. So how does generational wealth play a role in gentrification and, you know, I guess economic development for folks and what sure. we should be pushing for with some of these policies? Sure. I mean, I think when you have generational wealth, you have economic power. You have the opportunity to buy the warehouse spaces, Correct. to buy the commercial developments, to create the wine bar that never existed in the neighborhood, right. or create right this <laughs> local artisan pizza shop that came out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, but if you don't, if you don't have access to capital, right. if you don't have access to things that allow you to be able to bid on construction contracts, mm -hmm. then how would you be able to take advantage or be a part of that economic development? And so I think having generational wealth allows someone to, to be able to become a business owner if they want to, or a local mm -hmm. entrepreneur. In DC, we have a lot of what we call legacy businesses, yes. our small and local businesses, and they struggle. And they're struggling right now because their, their property taxes are increasing exponentially, mm. but at the same time, the revenues are not the same. And so kind of, you know, Having generational wealth and having access to capital and things like that help to keep those local legacy businesses. And then it helps to create new businesses that hopefully if communities of color have that generational wealth, then we own pieces of the pie. Yes. And in order to, you know, and you have that capital and that generational wealth, then you have a seat at the table. They're willing to take a meeting with you. Right. They know they have to listen to you. Yeah. Even if it comes down to the community having to pool, pool its resources yeah. mm -hmm. to have that conversation and say, this is what, you know, what are you looking for? This is what we have in order yeah. to keep our legacy, in order to keep our communities together. Absolutely. Right. 
Well, we're going to have to figure out a way to bring you guys back because we're already <laughs> out of time. <laughs> oh, already gone through it all. <laughs> okay. um, but thank you guys both for coming from uh, the National Bar Association, making your way up here from D.C. Thank Absolutely. you. Um, unfortunately, as I was mentioning, that's all the time we have today. But again, I'd want to thank both of you, Chanel. Thank You're you, welcome. Henry. You're welcome. And uh, thank you for watching Raising the Bar on the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Awesome. Goodbye.